Colin Wilcox acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to all First Nations people joining us today. Hello and welcome to the latest episode in our Building Better Boards and Leaders podcast, where we examine the key issues facing boards and executive leaders. I'm Susie Lease, Corporate and Commercial Partner and co-lead of our Beyond Compliance program and co-host of this podcast. Today, I'm joined by my fellow partner, Meg Lee, who is co-lead of our Environment, Social and Governance Industry Group and has specialised in planning and environment law for over 25 years. We also have an ESG Wise podcast series that explores ESG trends and risks and emerging issues for companies. Thanks so much for joining forces with me today, Meg. Thanks, Susie. Great to be here. So today we're going to look at a hot topic on the board agenda that I know you and I talk a lot about, ESG insights, new risks, compliance and sustainability metrics that matter. We're going to talk about what boards and businesses should have on their radar from an ESG perspective, including expanding duties to consider nature-related risks and dependencies, as well as new mandatory climate reporting and more. We hope to unpack what these buzzwords actually mean in practice and what organisations and boards should be doing right now to be a real leader in this space. And to discuss these issues, Meg and I are delighted to be joined by special guest Debbie O'Byrne, founder of Planet Price. Debbie is co-founder of for influence company Planet Price, which is working hard to make a difference by providing AI-driven tools that incorporate planetary boundaries into decision-making framework. Debbie has extensive experience in circular economy consulting work for a range of government departments, private companies and NGOs in Asia, Pacific and overseas. Planet Price has a mission to help large organisations tread lightly on the planet by reducing the environmental and social impact of their supply chain and operations. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you very much for the invite. That sounds like quite a mouthful. <laughs> it's an incredible resume and I mean, incredible work that you're doing with Planet Prize. And I know Meg and I, we're, we're so excited to kind of nerd out on all things ESG with you and, and keep the conversation going because uh, we've had a lot of uh, discussion in this space and it, it is such an interesting area. Um, so I might start with a question for you, Debbie. Um, and on the panel that you and I did recently at the Hunter New Energy Symposium, we did have such an interesting discussion about the way in which good governance and reporting and compliance from a legal perspective works hand in hand with the work you're doing. Because to avoid issues and risks like greenwashing or green hushing even, um, as the trends keep coming, you really do need that good data and metrics so that you can accurately report on and manage these ESG issues and also be ahead of your competitors. So can you tell us a little bit about how your Planet Price tool can assist companies with the reporting, particularly with the supply chain and the way you've been using AI? Sure. So one of the, just to kind of put some context around this, you know, we've got these systems over the last couple of hundred years that have asked a set of questions and the reporting requirements, accounting, financial system is very well set up to answer those questions. So over that time, there's lots and lots of data that organizations capture. And now there's a new set of questions being asked and often the data is not there at all or it's there but not structured in a way that enables organizations to get those insights out out Mm. so what we're trying to do is and i mean i found planet price three years ago when i was actually trying to answer a scope three problem so you've got your greenhouse gas emissions scope three is the really really hard one um and i didn't think anyone was even looking at the planetary boundaries which was always an area a strong area of interest for me so when i could see when i saw the the first demo i thought wow this is really really interesting and it was very visual i mean i'm sure you have probably similar experiences to me where uh exec leadership teams say Uh, If it's not in three pages, I'm not reading it. (laughs) So how do you take this big complex information and make it simple? So the visualizations were important. So basically we signed an NDA with Planet Price. We gave them all our financial data. They literally sucked it out of the financial and accounting system. And then they used the AI. So this is kind of what the AI does. It sorts through messy data, uh, sometimes unstructured data. And at the time, it wasn't going down to invoice level when I was an initial beta tester, but it is now. Um, So we can get right down to invoice level. And so it sorts, it does what a human would take 
weeks or months to do in uh, we actually turned around a client's data in 24 hours um, a couple wow. of weeks ago so that's not hyper accurate in the sense that this is what we can tell you with the way the data is structured now but we probably need to clarify a few things and often those are what we call really we um, what are we calling it um blind spots and hot spots so the 24 hours or whatever, if it takes us a bit longer, we can tell them what the hotspots are in their data in that the visualization will show them um, the bigger the circle, the more you've spent on it or the worse the impact, uh, the, the darker the red, the darker the color, the worse the impact is. Very simple, very visual. But often within there, there'll be blind spots. We'll find a big giant circle called contracts or consulting mm -hmm. or inventory or maintenance. And and this is kind of the point I was trying to make earlier. Um, we didn't ask the data to give us a deep dive into what the carbon or planetary boundary impacts of those buckets of spend were. So we're going to have to do a little bit of digging. So that's the top down piece. So the AI is just really fast, generally pretty accurate. We have a confidence level that's um, provided to how sure we are that the AI has sorted it into the right category, the right sector, the right industry code. So, um, you know, it's been three years of learning, uh, teaching the algorithm, if you like. So that's kind of where we start. Um, and then it, it, it categorizes, analyzes, and then pops up. This is the planet price for $190 million worth of spend. We've done billions of dollars, but basically it says, you spent $2 billion last year, and there's a planet price premium on top of that that you didn't pay, but the planet did through all of these boundary metrics. So I think many of us are understand, understand the concept of a carbon tax. That is probably very likely to come at some point. I think the next cap off the rank will be biodiversity. Um, we, mm. we do pay water, we've always paid for water, but I think we'll see some nuances in that. So, so what we're trying to do is take the data they already have and give them the insights from that data based on you know just really smart analytics and connecting it to impact um, databases that will say this is the social cost of carbon, this is the social cost of smog or whatever the planetary boundary is that we're looking at. And so what we're trying to do is take quite a spaghetti soup of metrics on one hand, which is lots of ESG reports or, or um, environmental metrics. And then over here, you know, the big, the big kahuna on the other side is dollars. So how do you balance the spaghetti soup over here with the one metric over here. So Planet Price goes the extra step to put a dollar figure on that. So that's kind of where we're trying to give other planetary boundaries a, a seat at the table when decisions and that's are so made. Fantastic from a, a data perspective in that companies have so much data and they don't really know what to do with it, or maybe they're not collecting the right data. And I think about this from a legal and regulatory perspective as well, because you're bridging that gap really, when I think about the greenwashing issues that the regulators mm. have been dealing with and companies are making these sort of aspirational statements or, you know, advertising certain things, but how do they back that up with the data? Yeah, and I think this is a really crucial part also for us as lawyers when we're defending people to, to say, how, <laughs> sure. how can we say this isn't greenwashing, there's actual basis for this, but also as directors. So, you know, as part of our Beyond Compliance program, when we work with boards and directors, um, that the, in my corporate governance practice, it's all about the questions you ask as a director mm, and absolutely. how you're verifying that the statements that you're approving to go out there in the market, um, whether they're in your annual reports or in marketing or advertising, um, are accurate and based on actual data. So I think that's that's fantastic. I think uh, just to say that I, I don't think we've met a single client who doesn't have a data challenge in that, you know, and sometimes it's simple things, naming conventions for invoicing. So we this blind spot we have, how on earth are we going to set a target based on a blind spot like that? So, you know, we encourage them to make data in integrity and data um, improvement targets before they start setting targets to reduce anything. Mm -hmm. So often it is simple things. It's working with the, it's a change management exercise for the procurement staff or the staff who, who pull all this data together so that next year when we go and run this exercise again, you we don't have so many blind spots. And that's, you might not have changed your business model at all, but your planet price might 
change. And that's purely a data maturity issue. So don't get too far ahead of yourself and try to commit. Because I, I, I do um, take your point, Susie, about green hushing. But people do want to put a stake in the ground and go, right, we want to, we want to do better. And often the first step is improving your data. Yeah, that's really interesting. One of the, the concepts you mentioned, Debbie, which we might um, ask you to explain for our listeners is um, the planetary boundaries. Sure. Um, and, and you mentioned a couple of different planetary boundaries, and I, I think you had a slide at the conference um, about did, that. Yeah. But, but it's not a visual medium, this podcast. So uh, if you can <laughs> sure. sort of talk just broadly about um, the planetary boundaries, that might be helpful as, at the outset. Okay, so the planetary boundaries is largely um, attributable to, I always pronounce his name wrong, Johan Rockström from this um, Stockholm Resilience Institute. So what they're looking at is, you know, if you think about it, our economic system is a social construct that didn't it, it, it actually, you know, wasn't around a few hundred years ago. So we built that and it's built on things that we as humans can influence and change. The planetary boundaries is the hard physics. This is the physics of the biosphere within which we live. So most people are aware of, you know, carbon and climate change. That that one gets the most amount of attention. And, and to, be, to be fair, it needs that attention because we've clearly blown the carbon budget. But every year, the rock, uh, do they do every year, every two years, they look at the nine planetary boundaries. So they are things like ocean acidification, nitrogen and phosphorus loading, which obviously is a key interest in, you know, from the farming sector, um, aerosol loading, uh, you know, that's air quality, what are we pumping into the air? So there, it's a very well established um, framework mm -hmm. and we are outside six of the nine planetary boundaries. One of them is novel entities. Sorry, I should have wrote, written them down so I could list them <laughs> off. Um, and, and novel entities, when you think of things like plastics, like 50 years ago, we didn't have a lot of plastics in our ocean. Now there's by volume or weight, there'll be 50% of the uh, material in the ocean will be plastics by 2050. So now so this is a measure okay. of really, really critical metrics around what does a future flourishing society look like? I mean, there's a famous saying that says we don't need to look out uh, to save the environment. We need to save business because if we're all dead and gone, nature will take back over its to take back over its reign on the planet. It will be hu human societies that won't be able to function if we don't keep this safe space. So it's it you know it's often it's it's really tightly aligned to Kate Rayworth's donut economics perspective. So they they would have done quite a bit of work together to say right. So we have the physics within which we need to stay, these boundaries. Um, and that's often what drives this notion of Earth Overshoot Day. So you probably might have seen that on one of my slides. How are we overshooting? So these are the things we're overshooting to get to that point where we need 1.75 planets uh, worth of resources to live the way we live every day. And unfortunately for Australia, it's four. The way Australians consume actually needs four planet Earth's worth of resources and, and in including the sink capacity of the, the planet to absorb the impacts of that like um, carbon. So we're way outside the boundaries of physics. And then on the counteracting um, other side of that is this safe space where people can flourish. So we know that we've had a massive uplift in GDP and millions of people lifted out of poverty in the last few decades, but it's had a, it's it's been done very asymmetrically. So we've got massive inequality and vast majorities, or, sorry, vast areas of the world people are living still on a couple of dollars a day. They don't have access to fresh water. So we've got this massive consumption of resources that is not being equitably shared. Um, and, and I'm talking simple things, shelter, water, uh, food, energy. So that's what the planetary boundary framework is really the hard physics. Mm -hmm. So we have this notion and many of your boards will be devising their strategies and their growth plans for the next few decades. And the, the, you know, the general narrative we hear is the limits to growth are technology and capital. The limits to growth are actually the physics. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that's what Planet Price is trying to do, trying to bring the physics back into the conversation. And, 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 that, and things like TNFD and TCFD are starting to move in that direction also, which I'm sure you, you guys do a lot of work in that space. That's it's a great a segue. <laughs> yeah, there's a great recognition that, hold on a minute, we probably yeah. should ask some wider questions. Absolutely. 
So, Susie, you were on the panel with um, with Debbie at the Hunter New Energy Conference, and you talked about um, the new mandatory climate standards, which we're finally bringing in in Australia um, after you know what has been a bit of a um, long period of of no legal action in this area. But um, I wonder whether you could just outline a bit of what, how, when, um, in terms of the, the standards that are coming in in Australia and how that, um, and then we'll start to see how that relates to Debbie's tool and 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 what we can um, do together to help with that reporting. Yes, it's certainly an interesting time and, and we finally have the exposure draft of the new mandatory Australian climate reporting legislation, which of course proposes to phase in a new internationally aligned mandatory climate disclosure reporting regime. So for heavy emitters, large listed companies, large private companies, super funds, asset managers, um, and we're talking climate disclosures, so as distinct mm. from broader sustainability related mm. disclosures, which of course we suspect will follow in due course. But this legislation, it really sets up the framework for disclosures and reporting. Um, and it is proposed to apply to certain large entities, um, starting from in a, so there's a three phase approach to this. So it will be phased in. Um, and it starts from annual reporting periods commencing on or after 1 July 2024, which sounds really soon. Um, and I understand the government has called for feedback on whether this should be deferred to 1 January 2025. But at the moment, the draft says um, that July is the first group that this will apply to. Now, the specific content of the new disclosure requirements will be set out in new accounting standards, we understand, which are currently under development by the Australian Accounting Standards Board. Um, so there's some consultation in that space as well. And the timing of this um, will be interesting when you think about how many organisations are going to have to comply with this reporting requirement. And to Debbie's point earlier, what they're going to have to report on and what data they have and, and how they get ready to make sure they actually have things to say in these reports so that they can mm -hmm. comply um, and that they know what their supply chains look like and, and so on and so forth. So in terms of who this applies to and when, Group one, as I said, uh, is the first annual reporting period starting on or after 1 July. So the category one large entities and controlled entities that meet at least two of the following criteria. So they either have consolidated revenue of $500 million or more, or end of financial year consolidated gross assets of $1 billion or more, or end of financial year employees of 500 or more. So quite large entities, plus the category two national greenhouse and energy reporting reporters who are above that NGER publication threshold. And then we go to group two, which is anticipated to start from 1 July, 2026. And so again, those consolidated revenue, gross assets, employee uh, thresholds of 200 million in revenue, uh, consolidated gross assets of 500 million or more and end of financial year employee numbers of 250 people or more. And then that will also cover all other NGER reporters and a new category as well that they introduced in the draft of um, asset owners. So $5 billion of assets under management or more. Sorry, $5 billion assets under management or more, there's a couple extra zeros there. <laughs> um, so that final group three category is then coming in from the 1st of July, 2027. And those thresholds will be $50 million in consolidated revenue, 25 million in consolidated growth assets and employees of a hundred people or more. So you start to see how many companies, when you talk to someone with a hundred employees or um, revenue of $50 million, that's a lot of Australian businesses that are potentially going to be complying with this. And, and we anticipate the climate statements um, that will be being reported on will include things like material climate risks and opportunities faced by the entity, information on climate related governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, targets, um, the quantity of, of scope three and, and other greenhouse gas emissions, um, which are all being phased in in, in different um, stages as well. So I think um, that's a lot to take in. I appreciate yeah. that normally we do this in a table format because it's a bit <laughs> more visual and, and um, there's a lot of numbers and, and different entities. And I think that's the first step though, is to figure out when you're covered, if you're covered and, and when um, you're going to be required to comply with this. And, and there are of course some transition 
uh, pieces in the legislation. So there's a three-year modified liability regime, which does give Group 1 and Group 2 reporting entities some immunity from claims in respect of certain disclosures made about the Scope 3 greenhouse gas emissions, which, as Debbie mentioned, are, are trickier. Mm. They're a lot more sort of removed and, and hard to uh, report on accurately, I suppose, scenario analysis in those sustainability reports. Um, and that applies, that modified liability regime will apply from 1 July 2024 to 30 June 2027. But beyond those couple of types of disclosures, there's no immunity from other claims in respect of any other disclosures in an entity sustainability report. So you still be careful, right, around those misleading and deceptive type claims and things like that. So it's certainly going to be an interesting time. Mm, yeah. I say there's um, there's an ability to you know use estimates um, in terms of looking at your scope three emissions, but it sounds to me, Debbie, that you know you've got the tool. The tools are there for companies to avail themselves of to really look at the data properly and and not just base it on on estimates. Yeah. So we you know when we start to work with a company, we there is a lot of assumptions baked into those estimates, if if that's uh, what you want to call them. But we, you start with spend based data, mm. um, and there are lots and lots of data sets that have some generic assumptions. And we the one we use is has got like 40 different regions, like take New Zealand and Australia, for example, we have very different energy profiles in our grid. So a manufacturer in New Zealand would have quite different, exactly the same product, would have a, a different emissions profile because of the energy in the grid potentially that they're using if they're using um, purchased energy. So there are some assumptions. So, mm -hmm. so what we do, this, so that's our top down, and then we work with them to go bottom up. So when we identify those areas or our hot spots where, or blind spots, we go, actually, what, let's, what if this is a big enough or a material enough piece of your, of your operations or your business that we, let's dig into that and not use so many assumptions. Let's mm. see if we can get more granular data out of your system or out of your suppliers. So the first pass is gets you probably eighty percent there, and it's it's. I think we need to be really understanding and fair about the challenge ahead, and not force perfection. There's just no way you're going to get perfection in your first year of analysing your data. It might take you five years. So let's be really clear and go, we're going to tackle the top three. And often the top three will be three sizable buckets that, uh, you know, a good grunty dive into those will get you very close. And mm. it would almost certainly be giving you most of what was material. So let's dig into that data in a little bit more detail and see if we can get some bottom up. Um, and and so we've got lots of tools in the in the within the platform to do that. Um, like for some of our councils, which I know are not, I don't think they're picked up in that um, disclosure um, regime. But even in New Zealand, a lot of the councils are reporting as best practice, even though they're not forced to. So I think you know for them, roading materials is a big part, a big big fat red circle in their analysis. And so we would look at that and go, well, actually, what kind of concrete are you using? Do you mm. have more specifics? Because there's an average, there's often averages baked into those data sets, but there's some real innovation, particularly in Australia, happening with, because you've got lots of fly ash to decarbonize some of these concrete yeah. um, profiles. Let's get more, and if we can get down to an EPD level, that's even better. But it doesn't preclude you from doing it if you don't have a formal LCA or EPD. But it, it 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 just gives you a shot at getting the data tighter. So we would expect every year you you're you'd become more mature. You'll have done some change management for your um, teams to get to the point where you're more comfortable and confident in the data that you're capturing. Still, the AI will still do most of the grunty work. But it takes those blind spots and hot spots and makes them much more specific. Yeah, that's great. And this is also interesting as well, of course, from a corporate governance perspective. Um, as I alluded to earlier, there's no doubt that this is an expanding space mm -hmm. in terms of director duties. Um, we've seen, of course, the climate opinions and and a recently um, sure. released nature related. Uh, opinion in terms of director duties to consider under their duties of care and diligence issues like climate and nature. Yeah. And and I know, Meg, you do a lot of work in this space as well. Um, I'm really interested to hear a bit more in terms of 
your thoughts and how you see some of these compliance and risk issues playing out in practice. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Susie. Um, yeah, nature-related risks are really a, 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 the new space, um, really evolving area. Um, you know, we finally got the climate standards, but we're now looking ahead to, you know, what's next. What's next? And, yeah, and I think this will follow pretty pretty quickly. Um, so you, you mentioned the climate opinion um, put out by um, some barristers. Um, there's been a recent um, nature opinion, we'll call it, put out, um, commissioned by Pollination Law, um, that looks at um, director's duties under Section 180 of the Corps Act uh, that requires a director to consider, um, disclose and manage risks, gives the opinion that, that companies are now um, required to look at um, nature-related risks and dependencies. So mm -hmm. they're drawing on the, the TCNFD, um, TNFD um, document that you talked about, Debbie, where that's been defined as potential threats, um, which includes the effects of uncertainties posed to an organisation that arise from its and the wider society's dependencies and impacts on nature. So that, that looks at both, use the word dependencies and impacts. So um, impact the things that we obviously uh, are more obvious, I think, um, of, of a company's impacts, what they do, how they impact nature, but dependencies are, are a bit harder and um, probably I'll be interested to hear what Debbie has to say on this too about how you <clears throat> how you find those dependencies. But, um, you know, first it's looking at, you know, whether you rely on an ecosystem um, uh, to function, so whether you, you know, need raw materials, timber, mineral, minerals, water, et cetera, for your, for your business. So that's, you know, inputs. Um, but then also whether you derive a benefit from the environment, so um, whether you're relying on, you know, bees for pollination or, you know, yep, good water. conditions in your soil or, or water. Um, and then there's also the, the cultural sort of social benefits that you get from nature. So, um, you know, tourism companies that rely on the Great Barrier Reef being yep. uh, present pristine, and, yep. and pristine. <laughs> um, so dependencies are, I think, really interesting and um, I think harder to to understand, but really, you know, obviously very important. Um, and there's obviously multiplier effects where you, you're um, dependent, but also have an impact on that on that same ecosystem. So um, you can very quickly spiral if you're impacting that that um, that very same ecosystem that you you rely on. So in terms of directors' duties, um, I, I think again it's about um, directors understanding their their impacts and risks and dependencies, and it's obviously a complex task and and they need to rely on advice um, and tools to, to gather the data. Um, but it's certainly something that this nature opinion um, put out by pollination law um, uh, says is is foreseeable now. Um, it's very foreseeable that these, these risks and impacts um, are, are very present at, at, and foreseeable at the moment. So I think um, similar to the climate opinion, which really led to a, a change um, and really um, I think accelerated the requirement for um, a reporting framework, um, I, I suspect the nature opinion will, will have the same effect um, and lead to uh, requirements to report um, on those in directors' reports. And it's so interesting from that supply chain perspective as well, when you think about how nature and climate will impact so many companies in so many different ways, all up and down their supply chain, in their business yeah. operations, in their logistics and, and so on. And then the director piece, as you say, Meg, I think is, is fascinating that suddenly this is absolutely on the board agenda. It's settled yeah. now. Climate, nature has to be on your risk register pretty much. Um, and as a director myself, you know, it's something that you need to think about and certainly someone who advises lots of boards, we need to think about how we're asking the right questions to find out from management, from advisors, from people who hold the data in an organisation, what that means for us and how we can discharge those duties of care and diligence and consider these new and emerging risks. Absolutely. I, I don't know, Debbie, whether you had, uh, in yeah, terms think, of your tools, you may be focused on scope three and, and climate initially, but uh, I'm sure you're uh, looking ahead the, the too tool, to how you can, yeah. Sure. Our tool does everything all at once. So right. it's not a staged approach. All When we do an analysis, the, the, the same analysis does all of the planetary boundaries. We can turn on and off different visuals. If you only want to look at carbon, you can see that, but then you only want to look at water, you can see that, but it's it's all done at the same time. Mm. Um. I think the key difference that we're going to see with the nature related ones is it's much more hyper localized. 
So carbon and climate are kind of like a pretty blunt instrument that you can look at. Uh, it, it, there's a couple of key metrics in there, but with 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 nature, it's much more like a biodiversity hotspot in Australia. An acre of that is very different to an acre of farmland in deep rural part of Australia from a bio, from a biodiversity perspective. And the TNFD has what's called the leap approach. And the first step is location. So if you don't know the location of where your supply chain is extending to or where you're getting your materials from, it's going to be a tough nut to crack mm-hmm. what the impacts and dependencies of that are. And I do think that um, so the t- our tool, you know, we, we've, we've started, we're, we're looking at things like nitrogen, phosphorus, biodiversity, land use conversion. But again, a lot of those uh, metrics are still pretty blunt, if you if you like. 80% of biodiversity loss is driven by land use conversion. So even if you get a good understanding of, of how you might be impacting that, if you're, um, you know, getting supplies from the parts near the Amazon, you know, don't do that. But if you are doing that, you probably <laughs> want to see that land use conversion in the Amazon has been a catastrophic driver of biodiversity mm. loss. So that's a, a fairly simple one to understand. But I think what we we'll start to see is we'll... we'll I was talking to um, somebody from the biodiversity um, consultancy at the World Circular Economy Forum last year, as she was one of the presenters, and her view was, it, we're not going to be able to use the excuse into the future, we just don't know, it's it's all too complex. The, these drones can get down to a very hyper-localized area where you can find out a lot of information. And now it, it, it might be a bit tricky to do that, or you have to find the right you know, the right organization. But I suspect within five years, we'll have a bunch of startups who are out scanning and get using smart drones and technology, and they will likely be plugging them into our platform because we've mm-hmm. already got the sub the structure laid to capture those planetary boundaries. The data we're using are proxies or estimations or whatever you've got with the data you've got in your system now. But I think the expectation will be you'll get away with abstract, vague data for, you know, a period of time. But there will be a massive explosion of of organizations looking to get much more granular data around that. And when you look at something like water, I think water is going to be a massive pressure point over the next three to five years in supply chains, not just from where, you know, produce is grown like rice or or, or coffee. I don't know if you've been watching what happened to the Panama Canal recently, where 40 percent, I think it was 40 percent of uh, the global supply chain goes through that Panama Canal and it, it massive reduction in the ability to get ships through the Panama Canal because they're experiencing a massive drought. Mm. So now you have this tension between local communities who need water for you know, drinking and, you know, human life, life, (laughs) life, and then largely wealthy countries shipping, you know, Mm. products around the world that is now coming through this channel. And it's had a direct effect on the cost of, of, of products, because now they're having to go back down the bottom of (laughs) South America in a way that they didn't use, used to. So if that, if that issue compounds, um, I think that's going. So it's not just about your products and where you're growing them and where you're getting your materials from. Is there risks in your supply chain that are dependent on natural resources to get from here to there? And this growing awareness of what's called virtual water, which is water captured in products. I mean, I saw a really interesting graphic from Visual Capitalist. I love their visuals. It's like twenty-five thousand liters of water to make a leather pair of leather boots and 12,000 litres of water to make a smartphone. And uh, think about where most electronics are made. They're made in Asia. Asia is top of every list for water stress. So now we've got a water problem that is now potentially becoming a disclosure problem for boards. So I do think it is, like you say, Susie, the pace is phenomenal of change and adoption and expectations from regulation, um, particularly in Europe. So I, this is this is not a nice to have going forward. This is now going to become 
uh, expected business as usual capability within organizations. So we're working with some fantastic organizations who are looking. And what we want to do at Planet Prize is not just use it as reporting and disclosure, although we think that's super important and we want to make sure the platform gives people those insights they need for those reports. How do we help them make different decisions? We want them to use the tools in the platform to go, well, should we do version, you know, option one, option two, or option three? Let's run it through the platform and find out which one has the, the most dramatic planet price. And it might be a mm -hmm. slightly higher dollar price, but the planet price is so much lower, it would be hard to argue why you made that decision if you've got a stakeholder view of your of your business, not just a pure shareholder view. And I think that's driving lots of change and in, in thoughts and responsibilities and aspirations. That's really yeah. critical. And I love the analogy of that sort of decision making process to the not the not can we but should we concept mm. from a corporate governance perspective as well. We have so much to talk about on this topic with more to come. So if you enjoyed today's episode, stay tuned for part two of this podcast, where we will touch on recent cases that provide guidance on the ways in which boards need to manage ESG related risks, why there is an obligation to use data to make informed long term business decisions that are in the best interest of everyone and so much more. Thanks everyone for listening today. As always, please get in touch with us if you have any questions. You can find our details on our website, which is hallandwilcox.com.au or connect with us on LinkedIn. If you enjoyed today's episode, then rate, review or follow our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. This podcast is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as such you should always obtain legal advice about your specific circumstances.